All right, wait a minute. We're, we're... Oh, no, it's starting. Yeah, we're on now. Oh, no. So, hello, Parker. Hello, Pop-Pop. This is going to be the Parker and Pat show, or what you call the what show? The Popper show. The Popper show. The Popper show. And why, where did you get Popper? Pop-Pop and Parker. Pop-Pop and Parker. Yep. Where did you come up with the name Pop-Pop? Why do you call me Pop-Pop? I have no idea. I don't either, but I like it. Yeah, I just, I must have just said Pop-Pop one day. So you know one of the things I'm curious about? There's 70 years difference between you and me. You're 12 years old, or you're going to be 12, and so I'm 81. 12. So we're talking to each other. That's pretty cool, huh? Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure. Do, do you usually talk to people who are that much older than, than you are? Well, no. All right. So... What do you think it would be? What would you want to talk to an older person about? What would you want to know about an older person? What was life back then? What was life like back then? Oh, my God. Well, ask me a question it's more specific, and I'll tell you. Like, how would you grow up? Like, how was the water? How was your plumbing? How was the electricity? How was just, like, your common usages or whatever you call them? <laughs> well, I, I grew up in a, a smaller house than we have now. Well, we had air conditioning and electricity and plumbing, but we didn't have a lot of money. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but my father died when I was not too much older than you are now. His uh, heart attack in the middle of the night. And there were three boys in the family, and I was the oldest. And... Uh, so our life just changed dramatically and my mom had to work and support the family and I was a crazy teenager with a motorcycle. <laughs> I just did weird stuff. So that's part of what my life was like. How, how was your brothers? Like... You know, my brothers, uh, I didn't have a very close relationship with my brothers. My young, uh, the second brother, Fred, was, uh, he's 15 months younger than I am. He's not doing very well now, physically. Um, we did not get along well at all. We fought. And when I say fought, I mean physically fought. Oh. Yeah, it, it was so bad they had to put us in different schools. And I'm not sure, <clears throat> sure why that was. I guess it was because of the the age, just being so close with much jealousy or something, but we didn't get along well. And then my, the other brother, Jim, for some reason, he's not contacting us anymore. So one of the things that I admire about your family is that you're so close. And one of the things I've learned from you, and you know, older people can learn a lot from younger people. <laughs> I've learned how to say I love you a little bit easier. Now, when I was younger, like, I, I was obsessed with that word. My parents thought something was wrong with me. They'd be like, do we not tell you I love you? Because every single minute, I'd be like, I love you, I love you, I love you. <laughs> you still do that. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you leave, you sometimes you stick your head out the window of the car, and <laughs> as you're driving down the road, you say, bye, bye, I love you. <laughs> so that was a cool question you want to ask me some more questions I, I got 70 years of catching up to do with you oh wow yeah uh, I don't know how is the food <laughs> how is the food <laughs> well the food I don't really remember that much about it so I guess it wasn't all that good it wasn't as good as it was now did you travel a lot? You know, I didn't didn't travel a lot back then, but I had a, a motor scooter. You know the Vespa that's out in the garage? Mm -hmm. um, I had a Vespa just like that when I was a teenager, and I threw a paper route. 
You, you probably don't even know what a paper route it's, is, do you? The magazines that you just throw out, right? Well, they're not it's magazines. They're, they're newspapers. Yeah, yeah. the newspapers. So I didn't we, magazines, we would, but. they would deliver a whole stack of newspapers to us, and <clears throat> we would go, and we'd have to roll them up, mm -hmm. and, and then I'd do put you them get in the. Paid? Huh? Yeah. Well, let me tell you how we got paid. This was really. Oh, there's a. Uh, put May up here. Come here, May. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So anyway, what we would do is we would. I had these uh, racks on the Vespa, and we'd roll up the newspapers, and I'd fill it up, and I had this paper route, and I knew where all my customers were, and I'd ride down the street on the Vespa, I'd reach back into the rack, get a newspaper, and I would ride by the house. How did you know in the very beginning who was who, like who to deliver it to? Well, I just had my customer list, and these are um, people that paid me. But then the worst part of the job was once a month I had to go around and collect. So I had to go up and knock on their doors or ring their doorbells and then collect. Money? Money, yeah, because they had to pay for the newspapers. Why was that the worst part? Because some of them didn't want to pay me. <laughs> <laughs> And some of them would complain that I didn't throw the newspaper in the right spot in their yard. Oh, no. Or the last no. time you threw the newspaper, it landed in my flower bed. Oh, that's never good. That's no. never good. You just need it right there. Like, you should, like, just do it. And then let me tell you about a breakthrough experience in my life. Do you know what a breakthrough experience is? Well, have you ever had an experience where you struggled against something inside of yourself, maybe a fear or a doubt, and then all of a sudden one day you just pushed through it and succeeded. I bet you had that happen in sports, right? Mm -hmm. Give me an example. Well, in volleyball one time, I don't know if this is one, but I'm just going to try my best. Uh, in volleyball one time, I was really struggling to serve overhand. And one day my dad, me and my dad went after school and we were practicing, and he had told me, just try to put all your power into this one serve and get all your mechanics right. Just think about this one pitch. I mean, not pitch for me, I'm thinking softball. But volleyball, try to get this one serve, just this one ball over, one at a time. And every time I do, I think of that, which helps me get the ball over the net now. So I actually serve really well now. <laughs> so. This is a great story. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that same kind of thing happened to me because <clears throat> on the on the route, there was a boy, probably older than me, but he was a bully. You know about bullies? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You have bullies at school? Yeah. I'm not going to ask you what to do with the bully because I think <laughs> I think you just got some advice yeah. a little while ago. <laughs> but. <laughs> But yeah, there was a bully on my route, and whenever I would ride by, he would make fun of me, and he would throw stuff at me, and I would never do anything. And then I got to the point where I was scared to go down that road because I knew he would probably be out there. And so one day, I was riding by on the scooter, and he had this big limb off a tree, and he swung the limb at me and uh, hit me. And did knock me off the motorcycle, but it almost did. And that's when I had that experience of pushing through. I got off the motorcycle and I went over. Did you punch him? Remember the advice you got on that phone mm -hmm. call just a minute ago? Mm -hmm. I oh. beat the crap out of him. <laughs> <laughs> and I still remember it. Mm -hmm. I still remember, just like in the movies. I, I got on top of him and I had him on his back. Bam, bam. Now it was not the right thing to do. No. <laughs> but you know, I would just said, I'm not gonna take this anymore. And you know what happened after that? What do most bullies do when you confront them? Back off. But then after, after they back off, they sometimes become your friend because they respect you. They say, you know, I've been pushing you around all this time because I thought you were a weakling. 
and you just proved to me that you're not a weakling. And now I respect you. And he became my friend. How about that? How about that? It's a big twist in the story. <laughs> and then, no, no more twist. I, I just, then I rode down that street every day and, hi. <laughs> so we're about out of time for this first little Pat and Parker show, but you got another question you want to ask me? I like that. Um, how did you and me meet? Oh, now we're going to go. <laughs> well, Mimi and I both have different stories about that, you know. And Who's right? Well, Mimi says she's right, and I guess we're both right. But here's my story. I took dancing lessons once because I didn't know how to dance, and I was scared to dance. And... I figured, well, I'm going to learn how to dance if it kills me, and it almost did. But I, but I got, I got pretty good at it actually. I got pretty good at it, and so I got good enough where I could go out to these places and uh, check out the room. You know what that means? See your competition. Oh yes. Sort of. And I'd look around and I'd, I'd see, well, who's the best dancer here tonight? And as soon as I identified who the best dancer was, and then I'd kind of make sure that she wasn't too wrapped up with another guy because I didn't want to start any trouble or anything. But then I'd go ask the best dancer to dance. Would you go and for then, the best dancer of the girl or the best dancer of like everybody? No, the best girl dancer that was oh, there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, and then when I... A lot of times when we danced, then all of a sudden I wasn't invisible anymore. People would see me and an amazing thing happened. Every once in a while, women would come up and ask me to dance. That was pretty cool. So one night I was in this place and I'm checking out the room and there was this hot chick out there on the dance floor and she was the best dancer in the room. And so I said, I'm going to go over and ask her to dance. The only problem is she was sitting at a table with four guys who looked like they were mafias, mafiosas. Okay. They were in black suits and white shirts. And I walked up to the table to ask her to dance, and they looked at me like they, like they wanted to kill me. But anyway, you she, dan you know. she danced. She danced with me. And it was really good, you know, she was a good dancer. And so, now here's, I told her, I said, hey, we should go out dancing sometime. So I kind of, I was kind of asking her out on a date. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> and I said, why don't we go to Sam's Burger Joint some night where they have what they call a swing night. And, uh, because we, we were pretty good at dancing swing. And so I didn't know it at the time because I was new to, to this dating scene. Back in the old days, you would ask women for their phone number. But in this new world, you ask women for their email addresses. Really? Yeah. All right. And so, um, but I didn't know at the time that, that women would just give out their email address if they, they had no intention of seeing you again, but it was just easier to give the email address rather than say no. So anyway, I said, I asked her to go to Sam's Burger Joint. She said, well, yeah, maybe I could, I, I, we could go there sometime with my friends and we could meet up there and we could dance. Now, here's where her story goes. She claims that I said, no, I want to go with just you. And she said it scared her. Can you believe that? Being scared of me? <laughs> what? What? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> well, very I'm not. No. <laughs> So anyway, I had to leave, I had to leave the place that night, and uh, I sent her an email, again asking her out, and she sent me the nicest rejection letter that I've ever gotten. Wow! 
photo. It was. It was very nicely prepared, worded. It was polite, and it went on with these. How many this, rejection letters have you had? I've had a lot of rejection letters. <laughs> yes, personal and business. <laughs> And then, of course, at the end, she said again, maybe if we happen to run into each other sometime at Sam's Burger Joint, we could dance together. I just wrote it off. Just wrote it off. I said, well, that's all. That's it. Nothing's going to happen. So you never stayed there every night waiting for her? I never went to Sam's Burger Joint and waited <laughs> for her every night. Like a true love story. So this... <laughs> So now here's where Mimi's story comes in. It was like weeks later, I was at another place. I was talking to some friends. I looked over at the door and I saw this hot looking blonde walk in. She was blonde then. I could... You remember she had hair like yours. Really? Uh huh. Yeah, it was blonde. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I looked over and I saw this this blonde come in, and I just I kind of noticed it for a minute. Then I turned around and I kept talking to my friends. And as she walked by, I felt a pat on my back, and I heard her say, "Hi, Pat." I looked over and then she walked around. Oh yeah, now I remember. <laughs> and so then I went over and we started talking, and now. I have to figure out how to dance around this word. But her friend saw us talking. And her friend then told her, she said, don't, don't, don't get connected with that guy. He's a... Booger bear. <laughs> Booger bear. Nicely put. He's, Nicely put. he's, he's an A. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And so, because the reason she said that is because she was right. All right, she was right. Because at another time, she had come up and asked me to dance. And I said, no, that was an A thing to do. That was not very nice. And I hurt her feelings. And I, you know, I regret it now. And so that's why she said that. Oh, and the story goes on. You know, we're just probably... How old were y'all? Huh? How old were y'all? 20 years ago. That was 16, 17, 18 years ago. So you were like... 16, I was in my 60s. And you were in your... She was just a young kid. Yeah. You used to have blonde hair back then? Color. That's lots of good things. <laughs> that... I don't remember you was blonde. Uh, 16 years ago, you weren't around. <laughs> that is true. That is true. 16 uh, years ago, that was before you ever appeared on this earth. You mm weren't -hmm. even a twinkle in mom and dad's eye. Mm -hmm. You were a thought. <laughs> so, that is the best dog. She's asleep. But... Look at that. She's sleeping, huh? May. You need to wake her up. May. She's been sleeping all day. There you are. So one one last question for you. You you've got me doing all the talking here, and I wanted yep. to. Yep. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm in. So Helen, I want to ask you a little bit of twelve year old wisdom um, about winning and losing. We talked about this yesterday, mm -hmm. and remember I quoted Vince Lombardi to you. And I had no said, idea who he was. I know you don't know who he is, but he. <laughs> He was a football coach, and his famous saying was, winning isn't everything. Winning is the only thing. And so that's become kind of a mantra. Do you know what a mantra is? Like a, a saying or to a tool by. that people use to think. And so people get so obsessed with winning. And if, if they don't win, it's like their whole life is destroyed. So I know you're in softball. And you know what it's like to win because your team won the tournament and you were the most valuable player. But before you got to that point, you lost a lot too, didn't you? <sighs> so what have you learned about losing? Well, losing is kind of like winning, basically, because you're it's helping you grow and learn to know what you need to 
uh, fix. And like what he said, whoever this one is, this guy is, win winning is only, it's only anything. Like if you win, sometimes you get like, I'm not saying everyone does, like the biggest ego, you think, oh, I'm just perfect. I'm just going to stop working because I know I'm good enough now. I don't need any work. So that's what I think. I think losing is probably more valuable sometimes than winning. <laughs> wow. That probably made no sense to you all. Well, it made perfect sense. Total. Perfect sense. And but now then, wise. but let me follow up on that question. I've I've kind of seen you when you were out there on the field, and things were not going the way you wanted them to go. And you didn't look like at the moment where you were thinking, "Oh, that was a good thing. I'm learning a lot here." You look kind of bummed out about it. How do you how do you get yourself out of that? It's hard. You. It's kind of. You have to know your body, basically, like what uh, makes you better. And at that time, if you're really struggling, that's when you have to like dig down deep. You have to give it all you got, like what I mentioned with the volleyball uh, story. You have to dig down deep and know you, who you are and try to do your best, even though you're uh, not doing the best. So. Wow. Parker, this has been great. You, did, did you know that I'm studying to be a mindfulness and meditation teacher? Nope. Do you know about mindfulness and meditation? Yes. Have you ever done it? Done meditation maybe once. Do you know I'm going to be a certified mindfulness meditation teacher? I am. Awesome. And what you just said was a very important lesson for mindfulness and meditation. It's 12-year-old wisdom. Thank you. Anytime. And thank the whoever's listening out there. Thank you for watching uh, so why don't the you get, show. Why don't you get to get to May and hold her up so okay. anybody who might be watching hey, this, this is the cutest little dog you've ever seen in your life. So her name is May. She is nine weeks old. I believe tomorrow she will be turning ten weeks old. <laughs> she is the cutest little thing to me. She has all these spots all over her back that will be growing. It's just, she's adorable. And I love her. <laughs> okay. And the best part is that she does not howl at all at night or whimper. It's so nice. Well, that's the best part. I agree with you. <laughs>